document that, that it states your relevant information about you. So does anybody recognize what this is a picture of? <laughs> okay, great. I do some presentations these days and I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. So technology has definitely helped the production of a resume where we've got access to Microsoft Word, but it also creates some limitations for us as well, so we'll talk about those. So the relevant information that you want in your resume, education, skills, experiences, accomplishments, and job-related interests. So it is very specific what we want in there, and we'll talk more in depth about what those headers are. So the purpose of a resume, it is for you to create your own brand. You're marketing yourself and letting the employer know what it is that you bring to the company. So you showcase your skills and training and experience. You're basically indicating how you're qualified for the position that you're applying for. You want to highlight relevant information. And really the purpose of a resume is to secure that interview. So if you think about that, it's only the first step in the process. So if the resume is not clean and crisp, you may not even get the ability to interview and really sell them on your skills. Any questions of that? You, know, you can kind of be lost in the process right at the very beginning, which is harsh but true. So we want to talk about some tips that will help you create that clean resume. So it is definitely meant to hook the employer's attention. That's something that you want to do. So how long do you think it will be, your resume will be viewed by an employer before it's in the yes, no, or maybe pile? Seconds? How long are seconds? We just had seconds. Could you could you lose it right then or gain it right in that amount of time? How is that possible? Do you think about that? How is it possible? I don't worry to talk about it. Okay. So you want to make sure that it is definitely well organized. We'll talk about that. It's free of errors. We're talking about typos, grammatical errors, bulleting, misconfigurations, and reader friendly. Does anybody know what it means to be reader friendly? Easy to read, I heard. What was the other one? Easy to find things. Easy to find things, right? Point them out. You want it to be easily accessible. So I like to tell people there's a lot of psychology behind how the print looks on the page. And you can cause people serious hyperventilation and claustrophobia based on how you put it on the page. You don't think about it, but it actually happens. And it's really important. You want to make it as easy as possible for the employer to see, literally visually pick off the page what it is that you're doing without having to dive right into it in three, six, ten seconds. It's literally seconds. Okay. Are you scared yet? Now you're afraid to have a resume <laughs> handout, right? So this is also something very important that the advent of technology. We no longer have typewriters to type our resumes, so we don't have to pay somebody to typeset them. However, we now have the, the concept of Google and a digital footprint. This is something we could have a whole presentation on, about watching a digital footprint. And it's progressively been, um, what's the word, it's gone back, so it's almost elementary school students that we need to start talking to about their access to technology, what they put up on Facebook, etc. Because you will be Googled before you even have that interview in the professional world. They're going to Google you first and they're going to check out everything. And so the Facebook the pictures that you have up, the, the, the LinkedIn accounts that you have, the Twitter, Instagram, all those things that I can't even keep track of, you could also lose the opportunity for an interview based off your digital footprint. So it's something that you want to be aware of in terms of that online resume. So we talked briefly about that but something to keep in mind. So we're now primarily just talking about that um, hard copy. Okay. All right, so there are two basic formats for resumes. They're chronological and functional. The most common is the chronological. So it's when you have work experience and it's laid out in reverse chronological. So you've got the date specifically on there and you've got education in one area, the work experience, and then other interests. The functional is when you don't have a lot of work experience, you're trying to break into an industry, so you can't necessarily put specific dates. They work, however, they're not very popular, so it's really important when you're thinking about a professional resume that while you're in school you're doing things that you can add to the resume to make it chronological. So whether you're doing volunteer opportunities, any work that you're doing in class projects, you can put that timeline on there. Because a functional resume, I've heard feedback from employers and even employers at UNLV, 
they didn't know what it was. I asked, um, we had a, a student come in an example. <coughs> Um, she wasn't a student from UNLV, but she went from her undergraduate degree straight into her PhD, and she did not have any work experience during that time. So extremely qualified in her field, however, she had to provide a functional resume. In the professional world, they don't know what it is. So while she's extremely qualified, she was being overlooked because she didn't have that experience. So that's something that we want to also communicate to you. All right, so we'll move on and look at what a chronological resume looks like. And I know it's small, but you can kind of see visually first how it's laid out, right? It's easy at a glance to kind of pick out the information that you're looking for. What happens if you've got humans that are actually looking through your resume, and they're looking for minimum qualifications right off the bat. So they're going to want to come in here and pick up, all right, from April, May to August of 2011, they've got three months, they've got four months. And if they're looking for one to three years minimum years of experience, they want to be able just to go grab it out first, okay, and then they'll look at the job title and see that you have the experience. Then they'll put you in the yes pile, and then they'll keep on going, and then they'll come back and get to the guts of it, if you will. So it's easy for them to, put, to pull out the information. We've got the education in all caps. It's underlined. Those are optional. So the one thing is that there's not necessarily a right way for a resume, but there are a million wrong ways for a resume. So let's take a look at a functional resume. Can you see the difference? So it's still information, it's still easy to read, it's still organized, but what happens? It's just really not as easy to pull the information out of what their qualifications are. You do literally have to stop and read the information to even begin. We do have, uh, begin to understand, we do have work experience down here, but it's not relevant to the area that they're trying to break into. So while we, while we have them, and they're great, we want you to start developing the content for a chronological resume. Any questions between those two? Okay, all right, we'll move along. So let's talk about the organization of your resume. They really are typically one page for students. That's what we want. If you're a recent grad, and it's okay if you do go over into a second page, if you do have enough relevant work experience for the job that you're applying to. You want enough information, though, to at least fill half of the second page. And don't squeeze everything so much on that first page because you think that you're stuck to that one-page rule. It's okay to bleed over, but traditionally, it's a one-page because that's how much time they really have to look at that. In the headings that we talked about, the education, the experience, whatever it is that you want to point out, and you definitely want to create a flow to your resume. So you've got bullets, you've got bold, you've got italics. It's important because it differentiates if you've got University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and you've got in bold and Director of Career Services in italics. That's easy to differentiate in, in your um, line of sight. However, you must be consistent throughout because if you've got different patterns, it shows a definite lack of attention to detail, which can get you in the no pile right away. So you also want to avoid the large blocks of text. So we're used to reading those in our research articles, and we get them assigned by our professors, like, you've got to be kidding me, it's 40 pages and all of it's text. What's the first thing that we think? Yay, we want to read it all, right? No, it's like, oh, it's, you get overwhelming, and then you're exhausted just thinking about that. Don't do that in your resume, because it makes them uncomfortable. They don't want to take the effort to go through that. And it's not because they don't care. It's just that when you're hiring somebody, you have to take time out of your own job to put the resources focused there. So they really do care. So that's why you want to make it as easy as possible. Okay. So the content. It is really important to use those short, action-oriented statements at the beginning. And avoid the word I. I did this at work. I performed these duties. I comes across as it's only me and you're not a team player. So if you start with those words, created, initiated, maintained, developed, those are the words that you're looking for, and you're strictly keeping to the content, talking about the achievements. Quantify anything that you can. So if you increased sales, let us know you increased it from this to that. By just saying that I increased sales or increased revenue, that doesn't mean anything and you're going to make me dig for that information. Don't list the job duties. We generally know what duties are included in certain jobs. So you want what you did in the office if you research something. We also 
want to make sure that you have the present and past built in your resume. So while it's a working document, you might currently be in a job, they should all be listed in the present tense. But if you're no longer at that job, you have to go back into your resume and put them all in the past tense. What happens if you don't do this is that they might think that you're still at the job and that you can't possibly have this job and that job and if everything's in the present tense, you're working three jobs, how are you going to, which one are you going to quit for this job or how are you trying to balance everything? So don't let that um, be open for interpretation. And can anybody read the font below that or the, the make sure the present positions are in? I'm not sure I can read it from here. Maybe see it? Make Back sure row. the font size is appropriate. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> so that's an eight-point font. Not good for presentations, but it gets the point across. You're at between a 10 to a 12-point font, usually in the Times New, Ro New Roman or Calibri, something professional. Stay away from the fancy fonts. Those are very distracting. No frillies, letters, anything like that. That's not something that you want. And I'll give you an example for any educators, the teachers. I had somebody apply for a graduate position in my office. She was an elementary school teacher, and that's fantastic, but her resume was created like it was in the second grade classroom. It didn't have the logical flow. I had to search for the information. It had beautiful font. It was an amazing document, but it didn't convey the information that we were looking for. Those are types of things, so know the industry that you're going into. So, and using the keywords and phrases. So this is where technology also is beneficial, but it's hurting us from a functional perspective. Have you ever heard of applicant tracking software? Some of you have yet. So those keywords, and then when I said before, if a human is actually looking at your resume, you're actually really lucky, because they'll put it through these software programs, and they'll look for the keywords that's in the job description. So make sure you use those keywords in your cover letter and your resume because that's what that software is looking for. If there aren't enough matches, you're zipping right along and don't even make it to somebody's, somebody's desk. So some standard headings might be a little bit um, intuitive at this point. The contact information is something that you want. What you really want is a professional email address. Those jazzy and princess things are gone. That's something that you cannot have. You must have a professional email address. Using your, your Rebel Mail here at this point is a great thing to do. And addresses are becoming optional on a resume, just so you know. With all the software that's out there, don't put a PO box, you just don't have to list it. That's something that's kind of changing. And a LinkedIn URL. Everybody should start having a LinkedIn profile, especially if you're applying for jobs, you're applying to different graduate schools. That's how people are networking. It's also important to know that 80% of jobs are considered ghost jobs, so they don't even hit the market. So it's all about networking and who you know. If somebody knows you and you know that they know that you're looking, they'll connect those two. So start creating a LinkedIn profile. Get that information out there. Let them know that you're a graduate student at UNLV, other things that you're involved in. It's your online resume, and it gives you more freedom and flexibility to put more information that you can quote unquote cram on one page of paper. So the experience. This is where if you don't have any of these information here, you want to start collecting that, that experience now. Start volunteering. What other types of projects can you be involved in? Any full-time or part-time work that's relevant to your area, you want to start collecting that now because that's a header that you're going to want to have on your resume. Okay, next. And you can see myriad of headings that you can choose from. However, it's important that it reflects your background. That's why it's your document. It's a living document. You can't really copy off your neighbor and do what they did because your experience is going to be different. And you want yourself to shine above everybody else. So make it, make it your own for sure. Okay, thanks. So this is really important. And this is really cool. And this is my psychology background coming in. And even where we're, um, the psychology I was talking to you about a resume. This is, uh, granted, it's a study and I could pull the literature abstract and read it, but I didn't. Um, this, the hot spots, are where recruiters look at your resume on the document first. So this is why it's important to put information in key spots to start. So they look left or right, where the header, your demographic information is going to be. 
And then on the left hand side, about two thirds of the page, all of the other blue area kind of just gets off into the distance. So that's why those action oriented statements are first. That's the information that's going to, to tie them in to be able to finish that statement. This is something that I find very fascinating because there is kind of that psychology behind how do we even look at the information and a lot of people probably aren't even aware that they're being affected by the different font sizes and how it's presented. So, references. It is absolutely not necessary to include references on your resume. Please don't, in fact, they don't belong there. Please don't even put references available upon request. You're taking up real estate on your resume and it's inferred, it's assumed, you're going to provide references, so don't put it anywhere on your resume. But, on a separate page, with your name on it, so they make sure that you are associated with those references, you want to be prepared to have three to five professional references. If you don't have those, now it's time to start getting to know the faculty members in your office. Introduce yourself, because they can't be a reference for you if they don't know who you are or what you've done to talk about your work. If you've got jobs, if you've burned any bridges from past employers, you can't use them as a reference, you need to start finding a new job or new um, people to use as reference. This is something that's very important and why you shouldn't burn the bridges because you never know when it's going to um, come back on you. So include this information on the, the references, but you sure want to ask permission of this person first before you list them as a reference. You also, again, this seems obvious, want to make sure that they're going to be speaking positively of you. You may think that you've got a great relationship with them, but if you really know that your work is subpar, they're not going to put their reputation online otherwise, so be careful with that. So we also do know that we're giving you almost inflated positive references, but I've seen many different references that I've called myself, and they can go full spectrum, and I've had people, honestly, not give positive references and if two people are tied and the references come in glowing on one area and they're kind of eh, on the other it makes a difference in terms of who gets selected and let them know of the, uh, the references keep them informed of your job search let them just a quick email hey I apply for this because if they get a phone call it's like you know I'm calling I know that you know Rachel and you're saying Rachel who I don't know who that is that's also bad too so a quick email keeps them updated so, a few tips. Keep your documents on brand and up to date. Absolutely, who are you, what are you? Do not try to be somebody else because that's not what they want. The job description is out there and employer is going to throw everything out there looking for this ideal employer, employee. They don't really exist, but they want to get as many matches as possible. And avoid text speak. I know that we all know what this is, but the resume is a formal document just like the cover letter is a formal document. And we've seen text speak creep into cover letters and resumes. I know, big grimace, and I've recently had employers tell me that. And just, hey, we've got some education campaign that we need to do on campus here. So the words R and U is A-R-E and Y-O-U, not R and U. <laughs> just, just communicating that. I wanted to fall over, but it's true. Keep it, keep it out of it, even in, even in the interview, et cetera. So the cookie cutter resumes, have you heard of that, the resume templates? They're on Microsoft Word, you can download them. It gives you a good idea, but it doesn't allow you the freedom of flexibility to move information around you, get really boxed in. I have noticed from a fine arts perspective, from theater and, and dance, those, those resumes actually work from a template perspective. That works. However, a professional resume, when you've got that chronological order that we're talking about, it's going to be the kiss of death trying to update that, and then you're going to have to retype it. Keep it in a fresh, clean, um, Word document. Was that too harsh? You know, kiss of death. It's true because if you've got, you're trying to apply for a job and you're making a deadline, you're going to spend hours taking that information out of the Word document. So that's what we mean from the resume tips there. And we've got one more page there. So proofread your documents. This is very important because it's like the, the papers that you're turning in, you spent so much time with it, you're so intimate with it. There, 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 we can spell it lots of different ways and what is the meaning there. Have somebody else also proofread your document and it's even better if they don't know who you are. So that's why we've got those services available in our office because if you're asking your best friend and you've been working with him or her this whole time, they also know what you do, so they're also inferring into what you're communicating. I should be able to read your resume 
and I may not know specifically how to run a mass spectrometer myself, but you should be able to explain it to me and I get the gist of what you're doing. And this also goes without saying, not every time. One big catch there is a foreign language. If you speak a foreign language and you say you're fluent in that language, you must be able to read, speak, and write in that language. Otherwise, you're not fluent, and one semester of Spanish or French in college does not count. So, and I have had experiences where bizarre language you would probably never heard of. This person had it on their resume, the interviewer across the, 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 the table spoke that language. That person lost the interview right there because they couldn't speak back. It happens. They're going to be kind and considerate and finish the interview process. However, it's embarrassing and it's done. So when you do that just from a foreign, or a foreign language perspective, however, the number of years that you've worked, you must be honest. You, you, can't, you can't try to be somebody else. If you see a job that you want, work to better yourself to have those qualifications and put what you have out there because they're going to be expecting you to do the work that you're saying that you do do, and then when you show up and you aren't able to do that, that's not very cool. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Um, what, a, what about, you hear this a lot, when you um, change your resume around depending on the position that you're applying for? Would, is that something Tailor your resume to the position that you're applying for, absolutely. You don't want a standard resume that's just generic, that you're just handing out, mm -hmm. because it shows you're not really interested specifically in that. So if you're looking to break into a specific industry, bring those, those experiences. So you actually could have a five or six page working resume document that has all of the information there, but you're pulling out the relevant information and creating a, a, your own documents. You should have five or six functioning, um, not functional, but functioning resumes. Yes, absolutely. Any other questions? One thing also that I didn't mention is the objective statement. Have you heard about that? So those are going away. If you want to scroll back up, we'll look at the chronological resume. It's going away because, we'll go one more, it becomes too generic. It's like, I'm looking for a place where I can be a professional. It's like, well, we know that. That's why you're applying for the job. And it's actually, it's a gotcha type of concept because if you make it too generic or it's not specific enough, it's like, well, you're not, and you're looking for a sales position, but you just apply to be a research analyst. It's one of those things that's going to catch you up, and you don't want that. So pretty much this is, um, we're working on updating our documents. Those objective statements are going away. So I even read a beautiful objective statement. It was perfect for the job that this person was applying for. I said, use that as the interview. That's how you can answer some of those questions of what you're doing. We know that this is what you want to do, so that's just a little aside there. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Do you mind if I go from here? Can you see no, me? No, you're fine. Nice Close up. Okay, I'm going to sort of bridge us into CVs, and the, which is the academic version of a resume. Some similar rules apply, others are radically different. So. so, as we just heard, a resume is a brief overview of your work history, education, and skills. The rule is one page. Um, I actually taught business writing here for about 12 years, and I think the statistical likelihood of you getting onto page two is 12%. Um, so if it's not on the first page, the odds of it being seen are not good. Um, reverse chronological order, starting from the present, going back. Ten years um, is usually the cutoff. I know, I've actually seen some that have 25 years of work history. <coughs> Most employers aren't actually going to be interested in 25 years ago, especially with technology. I mean, more, really more than five years is out of date. Um, okay, and I'll jump over that because it was just covered. So curriculum vitae is a detailed presentation of your professional background, your fields of study, courses taught, presentations, publications, and service. There's no page limit, but CV should be updated annually. I actually do mine three times a year. Anytime you give a conference presentation or a publication comes out, or I do a service thing like this, 
Um, I'm going to update my, my CV at the end of the semester. Um, some people in my department have 30-page CVs. I'm, I'm not sure they actually get read. I think the standard is four to five. Um, and at some point, I've already started dropping off conference presentations and things I published on that aren't really in my field. They don't matter. So when you hit the five-page mark, you sort of want to start to discriminate against what you're listing. Um, OK, and the standard format is degrees first, then teaching and or publication history, and then awards and presentations. And again, each vita should be tailored to the type of position. So I have four CVs. I have a short one, a long one. Um, I have the running document from the stuff that I've cut out already. Um, I have a teaching CV, a research CV. So, um, so, and they all need to sort of stay updated. So open all the windows and copy and paste across. So, um, OK, just getting started. Um, how many of you are thinking about writing a CV or have one already? OK, good. That's better than last year. Mm -hmm. um, OK, good. Then this is super relevant. So to get started, you want to review your educational and professional history and list everything and anything that you could possibly include later. Just get a running list. Um, and think about what you've done. Depending on your field, you may have a lot of experience in various are areas. Um, every field is different, and you know what your field does. If you spend a lot of time in the lab versus um, teaching freshman core classes to get uh, the credit in your department. So some of the things that you can think about in grad school and trying to get involved in, um, and this continues when you have a job, I have bulleted over here, uh, teaching assistantships or, or teaching, um, our department's actually doing a we're moving from teaching assistantships to part-time. They're being paid as part-time. And so they're the full instructor on the class. And I would say that's a pretty valuable experience if you can get it to be the only faculty teaching. Um, research teams and research writing. Um, in my field, we don't co-author anything. But in science, it's the complete opposite. Nobody does an entire project by themselves. It's not possible. Workshops and certifications, if you do something like, um, we have a business writing certificate in the English department, uh, or if you do something, train in a particular software or have hazardous materials training, something like that, um, that would be helpful. Um, invited talks, um, I actually know a lot of people who in graduate school went to other universities and talked about what they were working on. So. Um, when you start going to conferences in your field and meet people, you might meet someone who says, hey, can you come over and you know, talk about this to my class? Um, that's a great opportunity to put on your resume. Conferences and other presentations. I love conferences, personally. I do at least three a year. Not everybody feels that way. Um, our conferences are pretty fun. So, um, so you should definitely do a, a sole presentation right, on your own, hopefully before you get out of graduate school, just to get it over with so you know what it's like. Uh, it's also really good practice for job talks, which are like massive national conference presentations. GPSA research forums, actually a great place to start um, honing your presentation skills, talking to people um, about your research. And they do both short, um, short presentations and also poster. Some fields rely on poster presentations, and we have both the GPSA forums. Publications, I'll talk a little bit about divisions a few slides up. Journal editing, if you have an opportunity to get onto the Law Review or the Pop Culture Journal, um, that's a great experience too. It actually makes you a better writer looking at what other people do. You'll pick up your pet peeves and start going, oh my god, I have to fix that in my own writing. Uh, committee work. I, I was on two honor student committees while I was a doctoral student, So because I taught for the honors college. So you should be aware of opportunities and kind of what's going on with undergrads in your department. Tutoring um, counts as a type of teaching. Professional affiliations. Yeah, I'm sure all your fields have the 
organization you have to belong to, and then maybe some less important or discipline specific. I belong to the modernist studies because I did my work in modernism. I also belong to the D.H. Lawrence Society with about 200 other people across the world. So, um, but you want to keep a keep list of those. Okay, so here's a list of standard content. I'm going to go through each of these sections individually and then show you examples of them. So name and contact info, public and private. Um, when you apply to another university, it's becoming more and more common to use both your home address and your university's address. Um, the CV I have posted on my department website only has the university address. I don't want someone Googling me and deciding to drop by my condo for a cup of coffee. Um, actually, we just had that happen to a new professor here. Another new professor in a, a different college um, just emailed her out of the blue and wanted to go to lunch, and, and we were all like, okay, um, who is this? And let's pull up his, you know, <laughs> find where he's going to lunch. So, um, so generally, anything that's available to the general public, you, sh you should seriously not put your home address on there. Uh, education, honors, awards, and grants. Professional experience and or work history. Publications are separate from presentations. Professional activities, extracurricular, community service, uh, volunteer opportunities. <laughs> Areas in which you're competent to teach if you are applying for a teaching position. And then university service. So we'll go through these in more detail. Name and contact, and this is very similar to a resume, slightly larger at the top of the page. You should have your home and university contact info if you're sending to a school. Um, you should have an email address, a phone, and if you have a teaching website, it's okay to put that on there. Um, okay, I just talked about public site versus search committee. If you have a name change, this mostly applies to women, I think, not to be sexist, but if you're married and your degree is in a different name than what, you, what um, you're using to apply, then you put your maiden name in parentheses in the middle there. Um, your last name and page number should appear in the header or footer of each page. This is because generally CVs aren't stapled and you drop them, right? So it's a lot easier to match name and page number. In education, you want to list each institution, degree, field of concentration, and the date you got your degree. Again, I'll show you an example of this. Um, if you're applying before you've actually finished your program, you can put anticipated graduation date. Um, if that's just your best guess, you shouldn't put it, you should uh, con estimate conservatively. Um, sometimes, well, if you're, if you're finishing a PhD and applying for a university teaching position, you'll have the name of your dissertation and your dissertation advisor. Hopefully that's a helpful thing, um, especially if you're working with someone well established in the field. Um, the names of your committee, you should only include if it helps. If you happen to have studied um, linguistics with Jacques Derrida, yes, that's going to help. If not, um, then the really the only person that matters is your committee chair, um, at least in the liberal arts. Sciences might be different. Um, additional research projects or areas of concentration, if you have them. Activities related to your graduate training. So if you're a president of the Graduate Chemistry Society, you should list that. High school information has no place on, I would even say once you graduate from college, um, if you have a degree from college, you don't need to list anything from high school. It's assumed you've finished and they don't care what you were on in high school. Honors, if you've received awards, dissertation awards, um, or fellowships, they may warrant a separate section. Um, if you don't have more than one, you don't want to create a whole section for them. Experience. Anything relevant to your professional objectives, 
um, but they have to actually be relevant. So you need to list the institution with which you're affiliated, your full position title, the dates employed, responsibilities and accomplishments. Um, this, okay, so I have bad and good. Responsibilities included developing various new course materials and instructional aids versus developed syllabus and diagnostic exam later adopted by department. What's the difference there? Yeah. Yeah. And also, something's adopted by the department that's it's pretty high price, right? Um, okay. And if applicable, you want to divide your teaching experience from research experience. Again, the sciences are more, um, consider their research completely separate from the classroom, whereas liberal arts, they're more closely aligned. Okay, so here's an example of formatting, the left margin is not actually that narrow. <laughs> but, so you see just the university address, um, plus office phone and email, education, so primary and secondary areas, dissertation and committee director, same thing with the second MA, um, employment history, current position, and then, that's funny, this is from last year, so actually I could add four more courses onto that top one. Um, if, if you teach, and if you're applying for a teaching job, and every course you teach is important. It shows variety. Um, if you develop a course that nobody's taught before, like this 231S is World Literature for Science and Medical Students which I piloted last year and is actually starting to fill this year. We've got multiple sections that are full. So getting involved with usually things like that, full-time faculty don't want to be bothered with because they're working on their books. That's a really good opportunity to get involved and um, do something different that nobody else has done. Okay, so I've listed course numbers in ascending numerical order. Um, professional or field experience. If you apply to law school or dental school, you also have to provide a CV, not a resume, but a CV of your academic background. Um, so any, any experience you may have had doing an internship or working as a paralegals, anything like that that might help show that you've, you're familiar with the field that you're trying to get into is helpful. Um, if you have professional experience not related to your scholarly pursuits, you can include it, but it should be a byline. Right? You really want to emphasize um, your connection to the area you're trying to get into. Some of the professional schools have licensure, registration, certification. If any of those apply, you should definitely list them. Okay, publications and presentations. You should list them in standard bibliographic form. So, um, reverse chronological order, um, title of the presentation, journal in which it appeared, and so on. Um, if your list is long, you might want to break down categories by topic or publication format. Um, and also, um, peer-reviewed and invited, which is a nice way to say there's no scholarly review of your work. It's anyone who sends it in can publish. Uh, and obviously, peer review is more important than should be on top. Um, I know I knew a lot of grad students who did this submitted or under review, um, which is OK as long as there aren't more than two or three of them. Um, it's nice to be able to say you have stuff out there, but if you haven't actually had anything accepted, and that's your in lieu of impending stardom, um, it, it does attract notice. Okay, prestige hierarchies. Um, some journals are rated more highly than others, right? If you're in the sciences, you can publish in science or nature, and everything else is second tier. Um, in my field, too, we have Modernism, Modernity, and the PMLA are the two you want to get into. You should be very careful 
not to pad your publications list and even consider omitting things that you wrote so long ago you're embarrassed that your name is on them. <laughs> because I've been on a hiring committee, we pull all the publications and read them. So if you don't want them to read it, don't list it. Okay, so here's an awards section, publications um, divided into refereed and invited with the presentation, the conference it's at, and then the city is not strictly necessary, but the year that you presented. Grants. If you've ever received funding, you should list the funding agency and the project for which it was awarded. This includes dissertation fellowships, um, but even research grants. If you get them through the GPSA to go present or go do work in another state, you should definitely include that because it is an application process that's peer-reviewed. Um, in the sciences, candidates frequently list dollar amounts for major funded research projects. Um, don't double or cross-list your grants. Each thing should only appear once on your CV. List memberships, or committee work, and scholarly or professional organizations. Again, I have the dubious distinction of being sorry, a... Can I ask mm -hmm. um, if you go back one under the grants, you said that fellowship and dissertation support should be listed under honors? Yeah, honors are awards. If, so if a grant is funding your dissertation support, or...? Well, okay, this is dissertation fellowships, like the Marjorie right. Barrick Fellowship right. that supports you for a year versus research money. Gotcha. At least I would consider those radically different. Right. But again, your, your committee chair would say, this is what we do in our field. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, committees you can get involved in while you're in graduate school. GPSA. Um, organizing conference sessions. Actually, in the spring, our department, for some reason, has three field-specific conferences in Las Vegas. Um, and we also hosted one in um, my major area conference two years ago. So that's a really good experience, um, helping organize a conference. Do it once and you'll never do it again. Um, <laughs> honor societies that you belong to. Research interests. Um, you may, and again, this is field specific, you may, um, I say that because it should be obvious from your current most recent conference presentations what you're working on, if you're out there and, and sharing it. Um, but if, if you're not, then you want to be able to describe um, what you're working on and the trajectory of your project. And this is, if you get a job interview, you're going to have to talk about this in detail. Sometimes they ask you to submit a two-page research agenda. I've had to do that. Teaching competencies. Again, be very careful about saying you can do things if, if you're not absolutely 100% ready to be thrown in front of the classroom. Um, so for example, I'm proficient, not fluent, but proficient in German and Old English, um, and I've taught Middle English literature, so I might highlight my interest in teaching department core classes. I'm actually teaching this this semester. I got it. Um, so, but be careful not to list so much stuff that it looks like you'll study everything and anything across the board. Um, you want to stay in your area. Um, if you list a subject as a teaching competency, some other part of your vita or your education should show why you're qualified to teach that. And then if you list specific courses, um, for example, you saw all those courses on the first page of my resume, you should have a syllabus for every one of those with texts because when you're interviewed, you'll need a folder of them. They'll ask you, what did you teach for this class? Why did you choose this textbook? What were the writing assignments like? so on. So every time you teach a class, keep all that stuff nice and organized because you'll need it in the future. Additional information, service. Uh, university committees, things I've served on, the Writing Links program, accreditation, general education reform, mentoring or tutoring, doing things like working in the Writing Center or in advising or the CAP office. 
field conferences, um, anything. You can have a personal section where you include things that don't fit anywhere else, like foreign languages, travel, or other things you do that are, um, if you're volunteering every weekend to collect data off the books, for example, um, or doing interviews that on a project you haven't started yet, you could list those. References, again, no longer part of the CV. They should be on a separate sheet. Um, I, I'm trying to think. Two years ago, most people were using Interfolio. Three years ago. And then two years ago, several universities started their own sites or started using third party application. This is for us a logistical nightmare because you have to create a login and load every single document individually. Um, Interfolio is nice because you can just type in the institution to which you're applying, load the letters, and hit send. And then they bill you for the postage. Um, but Interfolio used to be the only game in town, and now they've got competition. And unfortunately, universities are branching out. So, um, What is the benefit to the person who's writing your reference letter for using Interfolio? Um, you don't have to keep asking them to send letters. So they can just write one, They, they she upload rocks, it. puts it up there. Right. Now I did ask people to update the dates on their letters and include, you know, a recent publication um, after three years. So your, your reference letters do need to be within two or three years. At three years they're old and they need to be updated. And this is fairly commonly used? Interfolio. It was almost exclusively used five years back. Remember when we mm -hmm. when we got together mm -hmm. and set up a university account? But there are several other services now doing the same thing, and universities are just sort of picking. So most people, ones. if you ask your professor, they should know what you're talking about. What do you mean? If I ask yeah. them to load a. Yeah, absolutely. And what with Interfolio, even if you're loading your resume and writing sample through the University of Washington's platform, you still send your reference letters through Interfolio. I will say, though, I, I was chair of a job search last spring, and, and not one of our finalists used this. Yeah, I've never so it may, be, it may be field specific to some degree, too. Mm -hmm. and we can hear it. Yeah. Well, I've seen a, um, in the last two years, um, some universities are creating their own. And as we move to the ACE accounts, this might be a possibility, too, because UNLV has an internal HR. But you can't submit your own reference letters. Right. So um, I would say that Interfolio is worth it just to send out letters. Because in an average job search, you're supposed to be applying to 40 to 50 or positions. I think 10 or 12 good fits are better. But still, you don't want to have to track down your advisor who's on sabbatical. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and get them to update and send a letter. This is a better way to handle letters. All right, so list of service. So I've been on the editorial board of the Pop Culture Review for years. I redesigned the world literature um, courses in Blackboard when they launched the new Blackboard last year. So um, again, tiny societies that you belong to, organized a book conference, served on a GPSA for several years. These are all things you can do before you graduate that you should try to get. Um, how many references do you suggest with CV? The same as the resume, like three or five? or? Um, yeah, you need three separate letters, minimum. Um, I've, I've sent off five occasionally. When I applied to post-colonial positions, I used our post-colonial person's letter, even though I, I had only taken one class with him. But yeah, generally three. One of them has to be your committee head, preferably two other people on your committee. They should be the most familiar with your work. Mm -hmm. Some ads uh, um, ask for a certain number. Okay. You know, like they want three. Okay. You know, or three names, or that, or five, or sometimes they'll be specific. Okay, and just a, a few notes about layout, um, very similar to the resume. Clean and clear is always most important. Uh, most important information goes on the first page. So 
spatially, the top half of the page in the left column gets more attention, right? We all know this. So um, use a consistent graphic hierarchy. Bold type is for emphasis. Headers should be all capped, but don't underline and bold them. You just pick one and be consistent with it. You don't need to triple whammy it. Use one or two, two at most, conservative fonts. Not something really cool that expresses the inner you. You have to remember that people reading your um, your resume materials are probably going to be a little older. And sadly, I'm starting to notice this too. If a student turns in something in less than 12 point font, I send it back. It's like I can't go, you know, it slows me down. So, yeah, so just remember that um, generally people on hiring committees are a little older, I think, um, before our 42 fonts to choose from. Proofread, proofread, proofread. Reading it aloud is a great idea because you tend to stumble over things if you say them that you breeze right over if you're just reading quietly. And ask someone else to look at it too. Spelling errors, inconsistent spacing, date format consistency. That particularly drives me bonkers. Um, and a an er simple error shows that you didn't take the time to proofread it. <laughs> Use your department faculty. Our department has finally started doing this again. Um, checking graduating students' CVs and doing mock interviews. Um, and if your department doesn't do it, you should tell the department chair they should. Because it's the best way to get familiar with what you're facing if you're going into academia. Um, tailor your Vita. I mentioned this earlier. You should have a teaching vita in case you're applying to heavier teaching load positions or community colleges uh, who are less concerned about your book project and more concerned about how many types of composition and literature you can teach. Uh, you might have a research vita which emphasizes your scholarly pursuit. I think these are dying, right? I mean, nobody's getting two two loads anymore. Um, at least not in liberal arts, definitely not in English, that teaching loads are increasing. Um, and, yeah, and general courses, from, from a familiarity with um, general core classes, being able to teach um, university core classes is a big help. Um, Okay, and I've actually, um, before I got my current position, I tailored a beta to administrative and advisory positions as well. So obviously my conference publications were not on there, but other things I did in the department were. Um, and you never know what you need a shortened CV for. You should always have a two-page version. I just applied for an NEH grant and had to revise and shorten a CV. Um, to fit their page limit and content information. So, so again, you should have a couple versions, label them by semester and year, and then short version, teaching, CV, etc. because um, when you go on the job market, you will use those. A couple of samples here. This is a postdoctoral applicant's CV in materials science. Um, so there's a profile section here, right, which is sort of a skills and objective amalgamation. Education, research, interests, and then research experience, things this person has done. The publications are further down. Social sciences, education, achievements and awards, research experience, again, Teaching on this sample is a little further down. Um, the sciences, research and publications. Okay, in hindsight, it looks like my field is the only one that emphasizes teaching over all else. But um, presentations, activities and services. These, um, actually someone who is not on my committee handed me these two books when I asked for help, and they were really helpful. So uh, if you are going onto the academic job market, 
um, the first one is for the job search. The second one is how you turn your dissertation into a book and other fun stuff we all hope to do at some point. Right. Yeah. Any questions? Okay. Uh, boy, that's a lot of information. I'm overwhelmed. That's the right one. But I think a lot of good information. So, um, speaking of the psychology of doing this stuff, I happen to be a psychologist. So I'm wondering how you're doing. Do you feel like you need to go shorten your CV? Because it's so long. You know what I mean? It's like, are you freaking out right now? <laughs> That's what I'm trying to ask. <laughs> Don't freak out. You know? The, you know, the CV that we saw was very impressive. Um, and that's also, you know, probably not going to look like yours because you're, you know, you're new to this. Um, you're either trying to co-chair of that. So I did, I was that front line of seeing literally the hundreds of CVs um, that went across. And it's amazing how sloppy some people are. It's like, did you even read that ad? I mean, it's <laughs> educational psychology. It's not psychology or it's not, you know, basket weaving or whatever it was. So that that should match. That job ad is extremely important. And I know you probably talk about how to read it and what that means, but you're right, that C V should be flexible enough to reflect that kind of job. Um, and certainly courses, it's like, well, here's the two that I've taught and those are good. Um, but it wouldn't hurt to go look and see, you know, where are the courses listed in that at that university for that kind of a job, and you know, think about that. Are you prepared to teach a couple of uh, core ones? Like for us, research methods would be one that we would want anybody to teach. Um, you know, we certainly don't want to, you know, be dishonest or things like that. But think about that. Or you know, if you're two years out, what could you be doing now? That's to me the the psychology behind this. Without getting stressed out about it. Um, you know, you're, you're a new hire, so we have certain expectations. We expect you to have 10 publications, um, you know, and a, a gazillion uh, conference presentations. No, but some. So, you know, that's where I'm, uh, I wanted to check with you on that, because that's, uh, you know, something to think about, especially now. I would imagine, you know, are you a couple years away from finishing, kind of? A, where are you in your... Programs. I'm curious. Yeah. I, I'm currently finishing a uh, master's program here okay. in the uh, journalism school in, in media studies, and I'm applying for some doctoral programs, okay. particularly in sociology. So I'm at that kind of juncture where I'm working with a professor of sociology, and, and we've co-authored now three um, papers that we're submitting to various journals, and we're presenting them at conferences, Fabulous. forthcoming conferences. Yeah. But uh, I have other sole projects as well, but. I've been told by professors in my department that you know the competition uh, among other applicants is going to be extraordinarily high, and so I'm I, you know I'm at this place where I just I don't know what should I just load up my CV should I yeah. should I trim it down you know it's it's an interesting place mm -hmm. so because you want to you know because you think about that you're you're moving on into a higher level of graduate studies right so. Can you do research? Do you need to be an expert in, in your case, sociology? I mean, you're already showing that, so that's huge. But the research that you did prior to that is big. That you, you know, maybe you've done a study from start to finish. You know, depending on your area, um, I think I would include those things. Yeah, just as a, off the top of my head, sociology, psychology, you're kind of in that uh, similar, just like kind of ballpark. Um, but yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt to try, for sure. Um, some of the things that I noticed, too, um, I don't know how you feel about a teaching philosophy. Um, sometimes, I wrote some, one. Yeah, some universe, you, you definitely need one. Yeah, That's a good so, point. But some, it depends if they ask you for it or not. Yeah, you can tell sometimes that the teaching is important. When you look at the ad, or you go to the mission statement, uh, or dig around in that university, you know, do your homework. See what's important to them. Um, you know, you can get a gist of that and go to your department, you know, that you're hoping to work in and all that good stuff. You can get a sense of kind of where they are. Doesn't mean, you know, 
make stuff up. We're certainly not saying that either. But um, I did write a teaching philosophy for this university because I could tell from that department that research and teaching were pretty much uh, of equal consideration. Um, so I elected to do that. I didn't have to do a teaching demonstration. Sometimes in more educational type fields, you get up and you teach a course, uh, you know, pretend, uh, not a whole course, but a, a class. Um, so that's interesting. That might be something that didn't come up, but you'd probably be able to tell that that might be coming down your way. If that was something I was doing, I would put in a teaching philosophy courses that I've taught or are prepared to teach. Um, a couple of my professors in uh, graduate school let me uh, do video, or not video, guest lectures. So I came in and talked about um, moral development because I was doing that stuff as a master's student. But they said, yeah, why don't you come in and, and do a, a mini lecture on you know, moral development in children. I put that on my vita, um, absolutely. So things like that, those opportunities that, that might be around, uh, especially if you're, you know, you know, you're not 10 years into this, we know that. So these are legitimate things that you could add to there that show that you've had teaching experience, as an example. Can I ask, uh, yeah. any, any patterns from CVs and resumes you've seen, think some of the most common mistakes? Uh, just that you didn't read the ad. I mean, especially with the, the cover letter and the, the CV really go together. Um, you know, and I don't know if you're gonna talk about that specifically. I didn't check your whole agenda for workshops, but you know your cover letter is one to two pages usually of uh, expanding on some things in your CV, not everything. Uh, you know, and sometimes that very, I'm applying for this and this job and it wasn't it. <laughs> you know, it's like, ooh, okay, wow. Well, I've heard <laughs> that happens, but I've never oh, actually yeah, seen I, it. Yeah, I have seen it yeah. recently, mm -hmm. um, you know. So it's kind of what Relin said earlier about this technology. It's like, well, I just it's right here. I don't have to retype it, so I'll just shoot those out um, without paying attention to the ad and the university or the program. If you're going on, you know, postdoc or you know, if you're going on into doctoral studies, if that's where you are, paying attention to where that's being sent. Um, meaning your cover letter can be. Uh, adapted to fit that, if it's heavier on teaching, like I said, maybe in your Vita even, um, put a little teaching philosophy statement in there. Um, so I think that, that's the big one. Um, you know, you're not going to get a pink piece of paper with, you know, some of that old-fashioned paper that you would get 10 years ago when it wasn't all electronic. But you're going to see some weird fonts and stuff that just doesn't belong, that's a little weird. Some of that personal stuff that <laughs> probably should be in there. <laughs> um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, I guess my question kind of is, um, I'm just a second year in, in the psychology right. PhD program. Good job so, being here. You so, are on the ball. Mm -hmm. and so sometimes I just wonder, so I, it's not very extensive to this point. Right, it shouldn't be. <laughs> um, sometimes I just wonder, um, like, what kind of other um, skills and things can you add on there, like, if you have, um, like, pretty much kind of acting as a lab manager and doing interviews for RAs or oh, updating, uh, fixing equipment, yes. research equipment. Yes. Okay, because I kind of sometimes yes. I'm just like, dang, like on my CV, like I don't yeah. really look that competitive, you know? <laughs> so I just kind of like want to know what I can add in there that's, you know, not publications or things quite yet. Yeah, just, I would you know, add those. I Absolutely. Just, okay. Um, those all are showing that you can work in groups, you can manage groups, um, and then I think I heard all of those had some aspect of either research and or technology. Mm -hmm. uh, those would all be things I would put on. Okay. Uh, you know, and if you're applying to a doctoral level, there's that kind of CV. If you're applying to, you know, um, a university that's research intensive, that's another kind. So hopefully you're getting the gist of it. It kind of depends on where you are. If it's a postdoc, yes, I can do research. You know, and here's what I've done, um, and you know, maybe the teaching kind of falls away if it's a mainly research kind of postdoc. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's it's kind of back to that psychology. It's like, well, I did that, but it's not very important. I mean, we tend to mm -hmm. do that, 
and it's kind of like let let somebody else run it by somebody else, and they'll say, "Well, that's really good," and send it you know, to my mentor, like, see if he uh, crosses it off. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. Doesn't hurt to bring it up, man. Right. Right. Okay. Right. But that's part of that where you know honors and awards. You, most of us, I think, tend to downplay some things um, when really you should have those in there. And then it's more about you too. It's not just grandstanding. It's more about you. So I think that's another one of, if it's so generic, and some of those came across, um, it really was just a, I'm just going to send that out to anybody who would be willing to read it. <laughs> and then you kind of go, now I'm sitting there reading it and you're wasting my time. That's a no. You know, so you don't want to waste people's time. If you're not qualified for that job, don't send it. Um, you never know what kind of bridge you might burn down the road. Um, you know, so yes, cast a wide net, but not so wide that you're, you know, offending people. Yeah, if I could you know, add on to that, um, that it, people in my department when I was getting ready to go on the market were like, you should be applying to 50 to 80 jobs. If you don't want to go live in Kentucky, don't waste anybody's time. Yeah. I'm, in the, I'm in the minority there, but I know people who have gone and interviewed for something just because they wanted interview practice. That's not, you know, people at other universities know each other. Yeah. So, you know, take each application seriously and really apply to the stuff you want to do. Um, mm -hmm. That's a good one. Yeah. And also, get into the um, whatever site your field posts job ads on now and print a couple. I will tell you that right when departments write job ads, there's usually what the chair wants, what the committee wants, and what everybody else wants, and those things are never the same. Yeah. Um, so job ads are, yeah. I think it's kind of hard to tell what they're actually looking for. Yeah, if you everybody think basically they want everything, you to be everything, and everyone. But they write them deliberately person. wide to give them flexibility with the search. But read them, get familiar with them. It'll, you can even start to see trends in your field, like. Mm -hmm emerging things that for us a couple of years ago was digital humanities and that's burning out now but initially when texts went all digital everybody's like oh my god we need somebody to do this so read job ads every year especially in things you're interested in but also in your field overall you can pick up on what's big I'll say in the same vein uh, look at CVs and resumes of people in your field at your similar mm -hmm. career stage that'll give you a flavor of things others are doing and um, it's, it's great to, to, some things you can just be strategic about. I mean, this, these are good reasons to give conference presentations, to apply <laughs> yeah. for GPSA funding. Uh, if you've got a very blank CV, you start yeah. making it less blank each time you do something. Yeah. And conferences, I know a lot, a lot of people don't like them. Um, but you go and see the people in your field, they talk about the book projects they're working on. They present, you know, this is my next project, so it's really rough. But, you know, they, and I guarantee you what Ann Fogarty is working on with Molly Bloom is going to be all anybody's doing five years from now. You know, so once you get to know people in the field and see what they get interested in, that's, if you follow it, that's where the jobs are going to be. A little bursts. It could be even during, you know, what a job talk is. So you get your interview and or your research. Uh, we call it a job talk, it's less technical, but, you know, and so whoever person that was, you know, they might be a big week in that, and they're sitting in the back, and you're talking about your mm -hmm. stuff, and they might say, well, so-and-so, I'm like, well, yeah, I met her at the conference, and we had an issue. It doesn't have to do maybe literally with your research, but I do agree that going to conferences, you know, and funding is an issue. I mean, my credit cards were maxed out because of conferences when I was, you know, a doc student then. I have to travel, I can't afford to put my, you know, to fly to do the interview. I'm like, oh, my credit card is full, you know, I had plan B, but, um, you know, a couple other students. Because um, you do, I agree, you can meet people, even if it's a huge one, go to try to narrow it down into your area and your field. Then it's not thousands and thousands of people, it's a handful that, guess what, in two years might be me reading your, your, uh, your CV. And go, oh, I remember that person. You know, it's not, it's hopefully not that icky sounding to you either, because I'm not really good at that. Um, 
but I'll tell you, you know, I was doing a poster presentation on my first ones. The other side of the person, her name is Barbara Hofer. And we just happened to peek around and started chatting. Uh, 20 years later, we're still doing neat things together. Just because we happen to be sharing a poster board um, at one of our conferences. It's, I do agree. Yeah. You, it just, you get to meet people. Other people like yourselves um, who are going through the same stuff. Do it. And you're right, a lot of local ones, um, I think across all of our, you know, disciplines, I hope, are happening. We certainly have some in education and educational psychology in Vegas. Those count, just like the other ones. Mm -hmm. so one thing I'll notice, next Friday, um, so a week from tomorrow, we, we, uh, we have a workshop on applying for academic and non-academic jobs. So we'll pick up some of these oh, very good. strands okay, uh, and, and hone in on those even more. Um, so at this point, the last 15 minutes, what I'll suggest is, Everyone who brought a resume or CV, pull it out and turn to someone next to you and start comparing your CVs and resumes. And then we'll move around the room and flag us and ask us what questions or feedback you might want. Since 